Let's continue with the 57 bus. Um, we have just finished part two where we learned about uh, the second main character in this true story, um, Richard, what his life is like growing up in Oakland and going to one of the public schools in Oakland. Uh, we learn about um, an arrest and some trouble that Richard got into and some consequences him being sent away to a halfway house to live his sophomore year of high school. We learn about relationships he developed with uh, one of the um, compliance officers at the high school, Caprice Wilson. Uh, so now that we know a little bit of background about Sasha and Richard, we move on in the story to part three, which is the fire. Monday, November 4th, 2013. A week, a week or so after Richard was robbed, Jasmine came into his room to talk to him as he got ready for school. She was concerned about his schoolwork. He complained sometimes that his classes didn't make sense. Now she told him he needed to talk to his teachers. You have to ask for help, she said. That afternoon, Richard's cousin Lloyd came by Oakland High looking for him. A heavy, bespeckled kid with a gap between his front teeth, Lloyd was goofy and boisterous, qualities that made him unpopular with the school's security staff. He was two years older than Richard, but he didn't act it. Just a big old baby, campus security officer Carlita Collins says. A big, rambunctious ball of energy. I always made Lloyd leave whenever I see him. Make Lloyd leave whenever I see him here. Richard and Lloyd were always together. Lloyd spent a lot of time at Richard's house since his own mother was often out of town. Richard looked up to him. He, was all, he would always be with him, Lloyd's brother Gerald sometimes remem or Ger Gerald remembers. It was just Lloyd and Richard. He was always following behind Lloyd. That afternoon, Lloyd wanted Richard to leave school early, but Richard wouldn't do it. So Lloyd hung around outside the gates until Richard was out of school. Bye, Auntie, Richard said to Collins as he left. He opened his arms and gave her a hug. He's a beautiful young man, Collins said later. I'm telling you, I didn't feel nothing but love when he hugged me. The 57 bus. Sasha's bus ride to and from Maybeck High School took an hour and involved as many as two transfers, but Sasha didn't mind. They'd always loved the bus, loved the intersecting lines of transit routes on the map, the crisp procession of times on the schedule, in their spare time, they drew maps of new bus, subway, and streetcar lines, or read up on historical public transit systems. Sasha loves buses in a way I can't even understand, explains Healy. I don't even like buses. They love buses. They like reading things about buses. You can offer them a ride home, and they're like, I'll take the bus. Most days after school, Sasha and their friend Michael walked together from Maybach to the BART station on College Avenue, about a mile away. Along the way, they'd pass a manhole cover on which someone had painted, Do Not Eat This. Usually, one of them would point out the instruction to the other, Hey, don't eat that. Most of the time, they split up when they got to the BART station. Michael would take the BART train, and Sasha would take the bus. Sometimes when they arrived at the station, the train would already be there. Dude, I got this, Michael always said, a joking reference to the impossibility of sprinting upstairs to the platform in time to catch the train. It didn't really make sense. It just seemed funny. They really weren't dude type people. After that, Sasha would walk across the street to pick up the first of two buses that would take them home. The 57 was the second. In the afternoon, it was usually packed with students from a dozen different elementary, middle, and high schools. On game days, the kids from rival high schools razzed each other back and forth. It was loud, obnoxious, rowdy. The kids were tired, wired, just sprung from school. The adults looked out the window or studied their phones, tried not to make eye contact. The bus felt charged with daredevil energy, hot, muggy, and musky with adolescent bodies. The first question you faced when getting on was where to sit, up front, close to the driver. It felt safer there if the chaos made you nervous. That's where girls tended to sit. In the back, out of sight, more room to spread out. You might even get a seat to yourself. Sasha liked the back of the bus. 
a platform seat they could spread out on, tuck their legs under. There, there they could read, do homework, nap. They had trained themselves to wake as the bus rounded the sharp S-curve just before their stop. On November 4th, they were unusually tired, having stayed up late the night before writing a paper for Russian Lit. Less than 24 hours earlier, they shared their exhaustion on Tumblr. Do you ever just get t really tired when you have a lot of stuff to do and you just start crying for no reason? Now, as the 57 bus rattled up MacArthur Boulevard, Sasha's eyes drifted closed. 4.52 p.m. Every AC transit bus is equipped with cameras that continuously record sound and video from multiple vantage points. The 57 bus was no exception. Cameras recorded Lloyd and Richard climbing on at the front a little before 5 p.m. and walking down the aisle toward the back. Lloyd chubby in a zipped up black hoodie, Richard lean in a black hoodie over a white t-shirt, and an orange billed New, York's Knicks, New York Knicks hat. The bus was a double length one, two buses fused together, like conjoined twins by an accordion pleated rubber seam. Most of the seats were taken, an older woman who wanted to talk to the bus driver about her route, a mom holding the hand of a little girl in a pink hoodie, a gaggle of laughing teenage boys. How's everything? The driver asked a middle-aged man as he slid his bus pass into the machine. Long day, the man replied, shaking his head. Richard recognized a boy named Jamal sitting at the back of the bus and greeted him with a dap. Molly B, Lloyd shouted, following suit. What's up, dude? Jamal was tall and lanky. He wore jeans and a white hoodie with a thick horizontal black stripe across the shoulders. His voice was low and thick, faded. At the, as the bus started up again, the two cousins gripped the silver pole in front of Jamal. Behind them, Sasha slept. A paperback copy of Anna Karenina lay closed in their lap. Their skirt, gauzy and white, dangled over the edge of the seat. It couldn't have been easy to sleep with Lloyd nearby. He bounced up and down trying to make the bus shake, rapped a snippet of the song started from the bottom by Drake, screeched random words like chinchilla and obituary. He shouted down the aisle to a girl he'd noticed when they climbed on board. Hey, girl, excuse me. A girl in blue bas basketball shorts turned to look at him. No, your friend, the light-skinned one. Jamal pointed at Sasha, whispered, look at this dude. Lloyd turned and looked over his shoulder. He cackled. On the video, you can't hear what Jamal says as he hands Richard the lighter, but you can see him take out his iPhone and point it towards Sasha as if planning to record. Later, Richard would say that it was supposed to be funny, like that prank show on MTV with Ashton Kutcher. Punked. He thought the fabric would smolder for a minute, and then Sasha would wake up and slap it out, startled. I need a good laugh, he'd said, just after getting on the bus. Now he showed the lighter to Lloyd, and then swung to the opposite side of the silver pole closer to Sasha. He flipped the lighter by the hem of Sasha's skirt. Nothing happened. Lloyd was still shouting up to the front of the bus, Hey, light-skinned girl! light-skinned girl. Jamal kept repeating what Lloyd said, his voice deep like an echo from the bottom of a well. Lloyd bounced up the aisle to where the girls were sitting, perching on the edge of a nearby seat. Go ahead, you do it, Jamal said to Richard. Richard flicked the lighter again. Nothing. Rebuffed by the girls, Lloyd returned to his companions, stopping in front of Sasha's sleeping form to shout an abrupt parrot-like, hey! Sasha stirred, but didn't wake. Whoa! You said, hey! Jamal echoed, screaming. Lloyd leaned close and screeched in Jamal's ear. Richard laughed and slapped Lloyd's head. Ah, uh, you just broke my neck, Lloyd yelled. Richard brandished the lighter, pretending to light Lloyd's sleeve. He looked at Jamal. Do it, Jamal urged. Lloyd danced between them, landing half on Jamal's lap. Move! Get off me! Jamal grumbled. He kept his eyes on Richard his phone poised. You might as well do it, he said again. Richard slunk back to Sasha, flicked the lighter. Nothing. He glanced at Jamal, grinned, and flicked the lighter a fourth time. Back door, back door, Lloyd called to the driver, ready for them to make their escape. The doors opened. Richard leaped off the bus. Lloyd started to follow, then he looked back and stopped. 
transfixed as Sasha's skirt erupted into a sheet of flame. When the doors closed again, he hadn't moved. Fire. The next few seconds of the surveillance video are hard to watch. Sasha leaps up, slapping the flaming skirt. Oh, oh, the skirt looks unearthly, impossible, a ball of white fire. Ow, ow, Sasha screams, voice high and terrified. I'm on fire, I'm on fire. Their hands snatch at the skirt, shaking it, waving it. Specks of flaming fabric swirl through the air. Sasha runs for the door and finds it closed. They turn, dance in place, screaming. Jamal howls with laughter. Then, as Sasha careens toward him, he cringes and climbs onto a seat. He's on fire, he yells. Put him out. Passengers sprint for the exit, shrieking and coughing. It's a fire. It's a fire. Some of the other kids on the bus are giggling. The bus is still moving, the driver just starting to register that something is going on way back at the far end of his vehicle. I ain't got time to be playing with y'all, man, he calls over his shoulder. Near the middle of the bus, two men leap from their seats and elbow through the press of people trying to escape. One man is short and balding. The other is taller with a walrusy mustache and sad basset hound eyes. Get down, the must mustached one yells. Get on the ground. The two men don't know each other, but they work in unison, shoving Sasha to the floor. The mustached man's shoulders smothers Sasha's flaming skirt with his coat, while the balding man stamps out the burning tatters that flame around them. It's over in seconds. The driver pulls the bus to the curb. Sasha scrambles to a standing position, dazed and in shock. Oh, Lord. That boy was on fire, wasn't he? A man remarks as Sasha pushes through the back doors to the sidewalk. Behind him, Sasha's mustached rescuer paces the aisle. Call an ambulance, he croaks. He goes to the door of the bus and calls to Sasha, who roams the sidewalk with a cell phone, charred legs. You need to call an ambulance, man. The girl in the blue base basketball shorts calls to Sasha through the doors of the bus. Are you okay? Sasha doesn't answer. The bus empties out. Passengers climb off, shaking their heads. That don't make no sense. That's really sad. See how he all burned all up? Oh my God. What would want, who would want to do something like that? Ah, oh, they got him messed up. That's effed up. That's hella effed up. Then the driver walks down to the, the aisle to the back of the bus and kicks the charred remnant of Sasha's skirt through the door. Real stupid man, he bellows watching. After he jumped off the bus, Richard strode away with his hands in his pockets, trying to look casual. Then he heard Sasha's screams. He stopped, turned around, went back. He stared at the bus, mouth open. The bus had begun to move again. The driver, still unaware of the fire, was continuing along his route. Richard ran after the bus. Suddenly, it lurched to the curb. Passengers spilled out, yelling and coughing. Another bus, the NL, had pulled up behind it, and after a moment, Richard turned around and climbed on. A few seconds later, he got off again and walked back to where Sasha now paced the sidewalk on bare, charred legs. He ambled past, snaking his head to stare at Sasha, then turned around and walked past Sasha again, still staring. Then Jamal and Lloyd got off the 57, and the three of them half walked, half ran to the other bus. That night, Jasmine noticed that Richard seemed sad. What's wrong, she asked. He wouldn't tell her. The man with the mustache. After the police arrived, the man with the mustache walked home, tears streaming down his face. He was in shorts and a button-up shirt, his jacket charred from smothering the flames. Why, he kept asking himself. Oh my God, why? Phone call. The school day was long over at five o'clock, but Carl was still in his classroom when Sasha called him on his cell phone. Dad, I need you to come over here right now. I was on the bus and I got set on fire. What? Carl said. The reception was terrible. Say it again. You have to pick me up and take me to the hospital because someone set me on fire. Carl was sure he wasn't hearing right. He walked around his classroom, closing windows and gathering his things. Wait, say it again. You were on the bus and what happened? I need to go to the hospital now. 
And then Carl was running, still on the phone with Sasha, still asking the same question over and over as his feet carried him block after block down one street and up another until he reached the place where Sasha lay on the sidewalk in their underwear, shivering and hyperventilating. Tell me again, what happened? Most of the passengers had dispersed by now, but a few lingered with the driver on the sidewalk beside the empty bus. One of them, a teenage girl, had called her mother, who had called 911. The girl's mother arrived before the ambulance did. She stood with her arm around her daughter as Carl called Debbie and told her there had been an accident. When Debbie got there, she thought Sasha must have fallen in mud because why else would their legs have those black splotches? And then she understood and began to sob. Well, Sasha said, it came true, what you were always worried about. The ambulance took a long time to arrive. The police, on the other hand, came right away. Do you know who did this to you? The officers kept asking. No, Sasha's teeth were chattering. I was asleep. They had never been so cold. Their legs were naked to the November chill, more than naked, skinless, exposed. Carl took off the outback hat he, had, he always wore and used it to shield Sasha's crotch from the eyes of passersby. Don't you have anything to keep him warm? Debbie asked the cops, forgetting all about Sasha's pronouns. A police officer brought a sheet of yellow plastic from the squad car, the kind usually used for covering corpses. Debbie didn't want to put it over the open wounds on Sasha's legs, so she wrapped it around their shoulders. At last, after maybe 45 minutes, the ambulance arrived. Paramedics loaded Sasha into a gurney and hooked up an IV. Warm fluids flowed into Sasha's veins. Morphine. The pain and cold receded. They were safe. Alive. Everything would be okay. Carl climbed in the front of the ambulance that took Sasha to the hospital. There wasn't room for Debbie. She stood on the sidewalk and wept as they drove away. Everyone had left except the teenage girl and her mother. They did it because he was wearing a skirt, Debbie sobbed. Together, the girl and her mother wrapped Debbie in their arms. That's no reason, they said. The Rim Fire's Revenge. Sasha was giddy in the emergency room, talking, joking, high on morphine. It's the Rim Fire's Revenge, they told the doctors, remembering how they had been evacuated from the fire in Yosemite with Nemo. Debbie and Carl had never seen them so social. Everybody's so nice, Sasha gushed. They're taking such good care of me. Sasha had been taken to St. Francis Memorial Hospital in San Francisco so that they could be admitted into the Bothan Burn Center, a specialized unit that treats burn victims from around the Bay Area. Dr. Richard F. Grossman, one of the burn center's surgeons, came to the emergency room to assess the situation. The wounds on Sasha's legs were a collage of colors, red, pink, black, and yellow. But what Dr. Grossman noted immediately was that many of them were white, a leathery colorless char that looked like overcooked tuna. That signaled third degree burns in which the skin had burned all the way through down to the fat below. From the emergency room, Sasha was taken to the burn unit. The first stop was an enormous stainless steel tub filled with a solution of diluted bleach. Infection is one of the leading causes of death for burn, burn victims. It was there, naked in the tub, that Sasha began to understand the severity of their injuries. Their legs were unrecognizable, weirdly colored, charred, and flaking. Dr. Grossman estimated that the burns covered 22% of Sasha's body. Still, he was reassuring when he met with Debbie and Carl. The burns were very deep, he said, but they were treatable. In the years he'd been at the Bothan Burn Center, he had seen much, much worse. We have people die here every few days, he explained later. I knew Sasha would not be one of them. The 10 o'clock news. Every night, Caprice watched the 10 o'clock news. It was part of her preparation for the next day at school. If someone had gotten shot in Oakland, odds were that somebody at Oakland High School would be connected, affected, or implicated. That night, the news reported that a man had been set on fire on the 57 bus. She shook her head. Who would do something like that, she wondered. Locked out. Caprice got a call from a teacher the next morning saying one of her children wanted to be excused from class. Then Richard got on the phone. I really need to talk to you. Caprice couldn't imagine what was so urgent that it couldn't wait until class was over. 
Come in at lunchtime, she said. He was there at lunchtime, but her office was filled with kids. She could tell he wanted to talk in private, but clearing the office wasn't easy. One girl didn't want to leave, and Caprice had to physically escort her out of the office through an antechamber and into the main hallway. As she did, she heard the door click behind her. She was locked out. Her keys and phone were sitting on her desk. Annoyed, she walked down the hallway to the main office and threaded her way between desks to the back of the room. There, she dug out the key to a side door that opened into her office. The whole journey couldn't have taken more than a few minutes, but when she stepped back into her office, Richard was gone. She found him outside being led away in handcuffs by two uniformed police officers. She never learned what he'd wanted to tell her. Maybeck. When Sasha didn't show up at school the next day, Nemo was concerned. They asked around, did anyone know where Sasha was? A student who was a neighbor of Sasha's had heard they were in the hospital but didn't know why. Nemo called the house, no answer. Then they called Carl's cell phone, voice shaking. Is Sasha okay? Debbie and Carl were at the hospital. They told Nemo what had happened, the fire, the burns. The surgeon said the prognosis was good. Carl assured Nemo. Sasha would be okay, but they were going to be in the hospital for at least a couple of weeks. Tell them I love them, Nemo said before hanging up. Nemo told Michael. Michael told Healy. Healy told Taya. The friends huddled together, shaken and in tears. As news spread, life at school came to a halt. It was unfathomable. Fathomable. How could such a thing happen in the queer-friendly Bay Area? We were all liberal, hippie teenagers, so we didn't even think of that happening, Healy says. But it had. Someone had set Sasha on fire. Inevitably, thoughts turned to the person who had done it. Hate him, Healy says. Hate his guts. Shyam. Shyam Sundar was the science teacher at Maybeck, a burly bearded man with a reputation for academic toughness. Shyam taught biology, chemistry, and organic chemistry and was somewhat of a le legend among the students. There was a card in the index card game titled Shyam. The instructions were, imitate Shyam as best you can, child. Shyam called them all child. Sasha was his favorite student. A scholar, Shyam called Sasha, the highest compliment he could give. Not a scholar in training, a scholar. On his way to work on November 5th, Shyam heard on the radio that someone had been set on fire on the bus. But it wasn't until Sasha didn't show up at school that he learned what had happened. He doesn't remember exactly how he found out. In fact, he doesn't remember much of anything. The whole week is, a blocked, out, is blocked out from my memory, he says. In his 15 years of teaching, he had never let anything get in the way of his work. Even when his grandmother died, he got the news in the middle of a lecture and kept right on teaching. To me, that's what she would have wanted, he explains. To me, teaching is sacred. But after Sasha was burned, he couldn't teach. He still showed up every day, but he just handed out worksheets to his students. Sasha had always sat in the same seat. Now that seat was empty. Shyam found he couldn't even look at that part of the classroom. The students who sat there, he said, got no eye contact from me whatsoever. I knew my baby. Jasmine was watching television when she saw that police had arrested a suspect in the bus passenger burning that had been all over the news. The newscaster didn't say a name, nor did the broadcast show the suspect's face, but Jasmine's heart began pounding all the same. The TV showed the boy's back as he was marched in handcuffs up the steps of the police department. White jeans, black hoodie, the same clothes Richard had worn to school that morning. I knew my baby as soon as I seen him, she said. As soon as I saw his body, I saw his structure, I knew exactly who it was. She called Caprice, who confirmed that Richard had been arrested. Then she began calling everyone she could think of, Richard's father, his probation officer, the police station, no one could tell her where he was, and so she sat and watched the news and waited for someone to contact her. Richard never called. He called his father instead, maybe because he didn't want to face his mother's disappointment. By the time Jasmine was allowed to see him six days later, the district attorney had decided to charge Richard as an adult, and his name was all over the news. The Interview, Part 1. When Richard arrived at the police station on the day of the arrest, 
the officers placed him in an interview room 202 and instructed him to remove his shoelaces, belt, bandana, and the cord from his hoodie. Then they left him there. The room was small and shabby, containing only a rectangular table and three chairs with blue plastic seats. The plaster was pitted and peeling. Pieces littered the floor as if someone had recently punched the wall and no one had bothered sweeping up afterward. Richard leaned forward and rested his forehead on the edge of the table. Minutes ticked by. He sat up and rubbed his eyes with two fingers, leaned back in the chair and stared at the floor, leaned forward with his chin resting on his arms, cradled his head in his hand, sat up and rested his chin in his palms. Ten minutes went by, then twenty, thirty. After an hour, an officer peeked in to hand him a bag lunch. He unpacked it, a soda, turkey sandwich, a bag of sun chips. He smoothed the paper bag flat and placed the sandwich on top. Then he folded his hands and bowed his head. He crossed himself three times. Then he ate the sandwich. He had his head down on the table when Officer Anwan Jones and Jason Anderson came in, two hours and 19 minutes after he'd first been placed in the room. They moved him into the center seat and settled themselves on either side of him. You didn't eat all your chips, man? Officer Jones asked. He was tall and African-American, with a shaved head, glasses, and an easy, sympathetic manner. I was getting a little stomach ache, Richard said. The officers assured him that they wanted to keep him things relaxed. They asked about Richard's life, where he lived, what sports he played. How are you doing in school, Officer Jones asked. I was doing okay, Richard admitted, but then it started falling off. The school's not good for me. There's too many distractions. I need to go to a smaller environment where I can focus. A lot of kids wouldn't understand that, Officer Jones said, nodding. I had the same issues when I was younger. Any girlfriend right now, Officer Anderson asked. He was white and heavy set, and though he smiled a lot, his friendliness seemed forced. I've been looking, Richard said. Looking, Anderson grinned, on the prowl. It's not looking too good, Richard said. Were there girls up in Reading, Anderson asked. They cool? Richard looked puzzled. He'd been in a group home up there, he explained, and hadn't been allowed to mix with girls. Jones sat with one hand resting on his knee, the other on his writing pad. Did you learn something in the group home? Did you learn some important lessons being away from your family? It was hard, Richard admitted. It took me actually a while, and then I was doing good. And then my best friend since forever, my best friend ever, he passed. And then I had a little breakdown. What happened to your friend? Jones asked. He was murdered. As the conversation continued, Richard was candid, almost confiding. He told them about getting robbed, about how he'd been set up by someone he'd called a friend. I have trust issues right now, he told the officers. Well, here's the deal, Officer Jones said at last. I'm going to explain to you why you're in here. We have some questions we wanted to ask so we can get your side of the story your version of what transpired. But before we get into that, I have to read you your rights. Miranda warning. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you can say be, you. everything you say can be, anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before any questioning. Do you understand the rights I have explained to you? Why did you talk, Jasmine asked Richard later. You should have waited until you talked to either me or your father or a lawyer. But studies show that more than 90% of juveniles who are interrogated by police don't wait to talk to an attorney and don't understand the rights the police have read them. They do what Richard did. They talk. Kids are not going to spontaneously ask for a parent, explains Barry Field, a law professor at the University of Minnesota and one of the nation's leading experts on juvenile justice. They're embarrassed. They're ashamed. They're thinking in their adolescent brains that somehow their parents won't find out. They're thinking, how do I get out of here? They read him his rights and they asked him, did he understand? He didn't understand, Jasmine says. And I know he didn't understand because I could barely understand. When we're in court, I don't know nothing until the lawyer tells me. The interview part two. You have a pretty good memory, right? Officer Jones asked when he finished reading Richard his rights. 
give me the rundown of what you were doing, say, yesterday after school, from the time school got out till, say, about eight to nine o'clock at night. Richard told him about Lloyd meeting him at the gate at the end of the school day and about going with him to get a phone from someone, a process that had taken close to two hours. Then he described getting on the bus and how there was a man on the bus wearing a skirt. He'd just gotten off the 57 bus to get the express bus, he said, when he heard screams and ran back. When they opened the bus, the door to the bus, he saw that the man's skirt was on fire. What do you think about dudes who dress up in skirts? Jones asked. I'm not with that, Richard said. I wouldn't say that I hate gay people, but I'm very homophobic. Jones nodded. Okay, why would you call yourself homophobic? I don't have no problem with somebody if they like men, but like if you do too much, nobody cares really. Do too much? Taking it to the next level, Richard explained. Jones asked for an example of the next level. Cross-dressing and like some people, like they try to make everybody know that they are that and they try to do too much and it's just a lot. Jones spun his pencil in circles on his notepad like the spinner for a board game. A lot of people share the same views, he said, people who display stuff outwardly for everybody to see. Then he asked Richard to go through the events on the bus again. I think there's a couple parts where you haven't been completely honest with us, he said when Richard finished. You're a good kid. I like people to be honest with me. We're going to be honest with you. I expect people to be honest with me. He asked Richard to describe what he and Lloyd and Jamal had been wearing on the bus the day before. Then he slid some photographs across the table. Richard, Lloyd, Jamal. Richard picked them up and looked them over. It's pretty obvious we have some pictures, Jones said, tucking the pictures under his notebook. And mind you, these are not still pictures. These are pictures from video. Both of the buses you were on, they have audio and video cameras, Anderson added. With that in mind, I want you to take a quick second and I want you to rethink the story that you told us. And I want you to tell us what really happened. You're not a bad kid, Anderson said. Sometimes we make the decisions that are not the best decisions. Keeping in mind that you know we have video and the video knows shows everything that happened on that bus. Everything. Right now is a time in your life when you've got to decide, am I going to take responsibility for my actions? Am I going to be honest? Because that dude on the bus whose skirt caught fire got burned pretty bad. Can I see the video? Richard asked. The interview part three. They only showed him a short snippet of the video, but it was enough. Richard slumped in his chair, one hand shoved in his pocket. Why would you set that dress on fire? Officer Anderson asked. Being stupid, Richard's voice was low. What was going through your mind? Nothing. Have you done this before? No. What would even remotely make you think about get setting someone on fire like that? Someone's clothing. Anderson persisted. That dude got seriously in burned. It's not like he went home. He's awaiting surgery at a San Francisco burn center right now. He got burned real bad. What was going through your mind when you decided to light that dress on fire? Nothing. It was a whisper now. Was it because the dude was wearing a dress? Did you have a problem with him? I don't know. People do things for a reason, the officer said. We've all made decisions in life that may not have been the best choice to make at a given time. What we're trying to figure out is why this happened. I'm homophobic, Richard said at last. I don't like gay people. Really? And you had a problem seeing him on the bus? I don't know what was going through my head, Richard said. I just reacted. Did Jamal or your cousin Lloyd tell you to do it? No. I know you said you didn't know what was going through your mind, Officer Jones said. But did you get angry because he's a gay dude in a skirt, not just being gay, but doing too much? Actually, I really didn't know that his skirt was going to do that. I didn't know that it was going to catch fire like that, Richard blurted. It was like a little flame. I thought it was just going to go out. But it was too late to backpedal. On the charging documents, Officer Jones wrote in block capitals, during suspect interview, the suspect stated he did it because he was homophobic. 